Thank you very much, David, and uh, uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, and I see, just checking at the moment, there are 88 participants, so you're not alone in your own homes or wherever you happen to be uh, joining our webinar. But before I start to introduce Stuart, I'd like to just make a couple of announcements of the next, hopefully, the next two meetings that we have a meet at webinar type meetings where on the 20th of October, where we have a, 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 a meeting which actually has, the speaker has had to pull out, but we're trying to get an alternative speaker and it'll be something in general, if it happens at all, on battery technology. So that's one day to watch. And then, um, I'm not sure I should be saying this, there's a, a nut on the, um, just checking the, the date on the 3rd of November, the, the, uh, um, there's going to be a talk on the science and technology of Antarctica and its impact on climate change. And it will be actually given by myself and, um, the, uh, uh, and it, it will be actually not just, it, it will have pictures of Antarctica, which was taken last uh, January. So, right, with that, I'll introduce the speaker, and very pleased to have Stuart Bryant on as a speaker, and he is actually an old friend. We've known each other for about, um, about 40 years, I should think. So, Stuart is a consultant to the Future Network uh, Network's research project at Future Way, based in Santa Clara, California. He's a visiting professor at the University of Surrey, and uh, he works on their 5G innovation at their 5G Innovation Center. So Stuart is a specialist in the internet routing system and is an author of 32 IETF specifications and uh, some people will know them as RFCs, and is an inventor of over 80 patents in this area. And Stuart's current research interest is in making packet switching networks capable of addressing the needs of new applications that require the network to deliver deterministic behavior, hence his talk. Over to you, Stuart. I'll just check I'm, uh, I am, you're getting, you're hearing me? Yes, we are hearing you. Okay, I'll get rid of the video, save a bit of bandwidth. Right, okay, good evening everyone. So this is a piece of work that um, started, I suppose, around um, three or four years ago. Um, and uh, I will explain the reason why this, uh, this work started and um, some, of the, some of the technologies that we are trying uh, to deploy to address it, but it is uh, very much a research in progress um, uh, subject. So, so that takes me to the next slide. Right. So once upon a time, there was an internet back in uh, 1973. And um, it was really intended as a best effort system to connect a, a few university computers together. That's what it started off life um, in doing. So they could save some money on the, the price of computers. Nowadays, um, roughly 62% uh, of the world's population can connect via it. Uh, roughly 82% of the people in Europe and 90% uh, of the people in North America. But the thing is, it's still a best effort service. You get what you get, you can't expect any more. Speeds and capacities and capabilities of the internet have been largely driven by Moore's Law. And there's a property that a lightly loaded best effort system works remarkably well. That is to say, if you don't stress it by um, running too many packets per second, um, it can do pretty well many of the old things that you wanted to, um, uh, to do with it. And it's worked well for services such as uh, regular internet technologies, voice over IP, uh, presenting, uh, I hope, presenting remotely um, uh, lectures, uh, video on demand games, etc. 
These services, though, are not mission critical, nor are they safety of life critical, and they are all designed with best effort uh, operation in mind. So what's happened that's driven the, uh, the need to do um, more? I've got some pictures that makes it a bit, um, uh, a bit clearer later on. So the 5G network, the 5G uh, systems, they've got a new radio. The radio is great, but uh, in order to actually get the benefit from that radio and get some of the applications that people want, we need to design the uh, fixed network that goes between the cell towers and uh, out into the middle of the internet to deliver what people uh, want to do. So 5G is largely deployed as um, the old 4G network with a faster radio, but we need to go beyond 5G and to 6G with uh, a, a lot of new capability that people have been promised. There are a lot of emerging applications, for example, the factory of the future, um, the media of the future, holographic uh, type communications and multi sensory communications. That is to say, it's a world where you should be able to walk up to someone, shake their hand and uh, give them a hug and uh, see them sitting next to you and yet they are a long way away. Um, there's a whole lot of transportation applications being uh, thought, uh, thought up. There's uh, a lot of emerging industrial applications and uh, well, the list, goes, uh, the list goes on. One project that I'll draw your attention to is an ITUT project. It was a focus group project, so it was an open project. And in that project, we looked at um, a, 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 the, the new requirements, the new applications, and a look at some of the new architectures that would be in the internet in the year or in wide area networks in the year 2030. Uh, that's an open access um, uh, piece of um, piece of work. If you Google for ITU Network 2030, you'll find it. Mr. Stewart, can I interrupt just for a moment, please? Yep. There's been a request on the Q&A. Could you move your mic away from your mouth a little bit? Because there's a little bit of uh, popping. How about okay? that? How about that? Better? Uh, okay. okay. Well, that should be all right. Okay. okay, over to you again. Sorry to interrupt. The trouble with having communications for a hobby is you tend to want to get plenty of power out in the signal. Some of you may understand what I mean. So new services. So uh, there are three really interesting new services that um, uh, have been driving the thoughts in my research team. Um, high precision communications. These are communications where there is a tight objective in terms of packet loss and packet latency. And there's this concept of in time, which is um, I have to deliver a packet by a certain time and on time delivery. That is to say, I need to get a packet to its target at a precise time. And these are very alien concepts in the internet or using internet technologies. There's also coordinated services in this group where uh, I want to build, for example, um, an, an orchestra and I want all of the, in real time and I want all of the traffic to arrive um, at the same time at the, uh, the target. I mentioned holographic and tactile. There's also a very interesting concept called qualitative communications. Now in a best effort internet what happens is you uh, apply traffic and um, if the traffic doesn't, uh, you can't find enough bandwidth, that traffic gets dropped. What qualitative communications is about saying, if I can't get it all there, I'd just like to get this bit of the packet there. And that's quite a, an interesting research, uh, research topic. Uh, so uh, factories, these um, um, factories require all sorts of um, communications technology these days to get the robots talking to each other. And I noticed, uh, I think it was Ford uh, using 5G to connect um, their welders to an IT system to record uh, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of information. Um, some of the challenges is although uh, industrial automation, which is sometimes called uh, operational technology, uh, have been around for a while. They use a wide variety of different uh, networks and uh, you can't get the sort of the economies of scale that you get in the IT world where you use IP as the sort of universal connectivity. 
Um, there are a number of barriers over here because the industry is very big, many, many players, very, very long life cycles. Uh, so it's going to be quite hard to get uh, to bring all that together. Holograms and um, holographic type uh, communication. So um, what holograms, uh, the challenge from holograms is twofold. Firstly, uh, there's a huge amount of information and we have to be able to cope with the with anyone looking at it from any perspective and shaking their head and turning around uh, just as you would if it was a real um, a real object or a real person but the in order to use it in an interactive way then the motion to photon time has got to be less than 20 milliseconds and that's quite challenging on um, a wide area um, network so on certainly on general purpose wide area networks and and we think um, that we have only five to seven milliseconds of that budget available for the um, for the network so let's look at Digital sensing. So um, we've got holograms as part of it. Um, but we've also got um, haptic networking. Um, I can't remember if I put a slide in on haptic networking. Haptic networking is touch networking. The thing about holographic and haptic um, interworking is that the consequence of getting it wrong is that the person taking part is violently ill. Um, it, it causes huge um, sensory uh, sort of misalignments if uh, you, um, you you try and shake someone's hand and they're not there and they appear later on and um, apparently it's really really bad news if we get it wrong and um, also uh, as I said uh, with some of these things we are talking about huge uh, potential uh, bandwidths to deal with. Uh, standard use case, uh, intelligent uh, driverless uh, vehicles, including um, some people are now proposing that um, uh, the vehicle is driverless, but not autonomous, but is driven by a, uh, an operator remotely. And um, one of the applications for that is uh, hazardous environments where you might, for example, have um, um, a, a mine that is where it is potentially dangerous and uh, you want to control a machine that's remote from the um, uh, from the uh, user. Um, so where is the spectrum of KPIs, key, key performance indicators? So what we're seeing is that industrial automation, uh, one of the important things over there is low packet loss ratio. Uh, tactile internet is not quite so important, but the latency is important. Um, we can lose packets from our hologram, but they better not be, uh, be late. Um, electricity distribution, this I think is about monitoring and, um, and stuff. So does the IP protocol stack work for this? Well, um, the classical IP protocol stack is over on the left. So you have to have a MAC layer. You have to have a layer there to transmit the, uh, the packets over the point-to-point -point link. Then you build a network um, over the top of it and they're uh, using uh, IP, for example, to connect a number of nodes together to route the packet through a number of nodes. And then you run what we call a transport protocol over the top of that. That's something to uh, actually allow us to have multiple pieces of traffic between two nodes. And then we would put the application over the top. But um, we're looking for low, low, low packet loss, low latency, uh, and in some cases, ultra low latency uh, down uh, in the um, uh, 250 microsecond class. Problem with doing this over regular uh, TCP, for example, is uh, you get congestion in the network. Well, that's not good for low packet loss. Uh, you get retransmission if you get uh, packet loss, and that's not good for uh, for latency. And uh, so uh, 
the thing really is um, not suitable for some of these um, high-end needs. By the way, I should say I borrowed a lot of these slides from a presentation that my manager and colleague at Futureway, Richard Lee, has, uh, has been giving for over a number of years to explain this uh, set of concepts to the, uh, to the industry. So, I spoke about qualitative communications. I'd not heard of qualitative communications until I worked for, uh, for Richard, until I worked on the ITU project. So today, um, it's really an all or nothing uh, world. So we've got to pack it and put it through the network. And with uh, TCP, we're, we were pretty certain we will get the packet through. And with UDP, which is a simpler um, uh, internet protocol, uh, transport protocol, we either get the whole packet or we get nothing. Transports of the future, um, we think, will be interested in partial information being better than no information because clearly um, if I, uh, well I've got an example in the next uh, slide but basically there are some cases where I'd like to get the important piece of the information but I'm not too worried if I don't get it all. I think there's an example that Richard put together. So this is, uh, this is Richard here. Right? So concept is that um, it's um, okay um, if I get if I get a noisy link and I get um, some of the packets or I get a congested node, um, I get just a degraded image rather than a uh, full image. This is conceptually what it is, but I am we imagine that there will be new uh, transports that uh, use this in a more sensible way rather than the rather crude and illustrative way that we have shown in this picture. So what tools have we got that might help us? One of the big problems with the, uh, with the internet is that uh, it's really hard to change. I mean, it's enormous. I showed those pictures at the beginning of the, uh, the slide. It is horrendously complex um, and very, very difficult to uh, change it over an end-to-end -end model. And at the top, I've got what the classical internet looks like, right? So I've got a host, I connect that to a, a consumer premises equipment, the, CP, the, C, uh, the consumer equipment. That then is picked up by a, the provider edge equipment. That may be an IP router, or it may be a very commonly these days, uh, a router using a technology called MPLS, which I think I spoke to the, um, uh, to, uh, about um, some years ago to this, uh, to this group. Then the packets go across the internet core and um, there really is no service uh, quality uh, control across the internet core. It really is what you get. No one's got any financial incentive to provide anyone with anything other than best effort. And the thing is reversed at the other end. So that is the classic caricature cartoon model of the internet that everyone thinks is there. There's a really, really great paper written by someone called uh, Jeff Houston, an Australian, called The Death of Transit. And he points out that the world is not like that and you could never do business in a world like, like that. What actually happens um, is that you connect to a server that is moved very, very close to the edge. And in fact, there's lots of deals with... Um, the very large service provider companies uh, that you probably know about Facebook, Amazon, etc., where they move their services very close to the edge of the network. So you get good latency, good response time, uh, low packet loss, etc. If they need to talk to one of their own um, uh, servers, then they'll do that in private. We have no idea, in principle, we have no idea how they're doing that. But there are other um, uh, cases. So, for example, if I was going to be in business um, uh, with, uh, say, a shop application or something, and I wanted to uh, provide a service to the user community, 
If I was of any size, I would not be able to do this on the internet core in the way that uh, it happened with people like Google and Amazon in the very early days. And the reason is that um, I would be subject to some sort of blackmail attack and knocked offline, etc. because there are people who realize that in the wild west of the internet, uh, but they can attack a, a user and extort money. So no one really runs a high-end, high-profile, end-to-end service in the top model. They run it more in the bottom, bottom model. And we're seeing this um, sort of model uh, appear more and more um, with some of these low latency demands um, uh, that we are seeing, for example, in a 5G context. Uh, now, one of the important things in here is that if you look at the scope of implementing a change to provide a, um, a service, it is just within that um, um, uh, colored uh, rectangle called SP1, for example. I only have to do the fancy stuff in there um, in order to roll out to a sensible number of people. Uh, let's have a look. So we've got some other technical help we can use. Uh, this is the technology called InServe, a very old technology. So that's about nearly 30 years old, 26 years old or something, um, which is uh, designed for, to schedule the admission of uh, traffic to the network. But people found that this was too much state. At the time it was, it was designed, it was too much state in the network and it never really took off. There's a, a technology called DiffServe, which is where if you look in the front of a packet, you'll see there's a traffic class. Uh, it's called a number of different things in a number of different packet technologies, but essentially a, a traffic class, which is says how important this group of packets is. And what you do is you look at that and you queue accordingly. It really is better than nothing, but it's a crude tool, although it is widely deployed. And then we have shapers. Uh, shapers prevent uh, bursts of traffic by smoothing the flows and avoiding peaks. And these are, again, very widely deployed, particularly in the ingress of, um, of networks. Uh, so what else have we got? Um, well, you've probably met VPNs, virtual private networks. You, 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 most, many people have met it in conjunction with um, hiding who they are, etc. But uh, there is a professional type of uh, virtual private network where a service provider offers what to the user looks like a private network, but it's actually running on shared infrastructure. And they do traffic engineering on that. So traffic engineering is when you steer the traffic into reserved resources along special paths. And um, a lot of this was done for a long time using a technology called MPLS um, traffic engineering, which relied on a technology called uh, RSVP, uh, which is a uh, resource reservation protocol. And uh, they also use uh, something called software defined networks, which is basically the old fashioned way of running a network where a computer works out what it is, is the way the telephone network used to work and um, um, and then writes the path down. And this is how we first built packet networks before we discovered dynamic um, routing. Some people have tried to improve on that by using a technique called segment routing, where the edge of the network, the ingress router, uh, specifies some intermediate hops and tunes the path of the traffic in an otherwise best effort network. Uh, some people have applied this to IPv6. Um, this does lead to some very, very long, uh, very large packet, uh, packet headers. And uh, there's also a technique called network programming, which is kind of a bit more sophisticated in terms of what it tells the packet uh, to do. But the idea is in all, in, in all of those segment routing network programming techniques that I can tune the path of the packet and tune the behavior a bit. Now, there's another technology uh, which really was driven by uh, 3GPP and, uh, by, and the ITU, which is called network slicing. Network slicing has been talked about for many years, certainly all of my time uh, over the last five years, and, uh, but it, it isn't really deployed yet. The concept is a really interesting one. 
contract concept was that every application would be given its own virtual network um, with the set of performance criteria characteristics that were um, that were needed for that application that's going to be tough to scale to be really really honest with you um, some people think that there will be one slice per application. Some people think there will be like three slices, you know, one for running the network, one for the user traffic, and maybe one for the emergency services. So there's a variety of uh, views on how many slices. But the idea of a slice is that the traffic in one slice is completely unaware of the traffic in another that the traffic in a slice has access to compute and uh, uh, storage app, um, um, resources within the network. Um, whether that happens or not, I, I, I don't know. But the most important thing is that, the, 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 that everyone gets a, um, a private network with the ca ca capabilities that, they, uh, that they've um, paid for. Well, how do we get there? So one of the techniques that uh, we've been working on over in the, the IUTF is a technique called an enhanced VPN um, or VPN plus. And the idea here, uh, and I must say that's driven largely out of uh, Huawei in, um, in China, although there are other people working on it. Um, the original idea was we noted that actually there's a lot of similarity between a VPN and a slice. Um, and indeed, uh, the thing that really uh, dictates the two is the focus on isolation. So the idea is that uh, it's assumed traffic engineering paths will be uh, created and uh, dedicated uh, to a slice. It's assumed that within the slice, dedicated queues and, slate and, and uh, shapers will be provided. So traffic within a slice is mapped to its own resources in the network. Traffic is tagged at ingress and steered through the set of resources that were reserved for it. So this is kind of much better than best effort. And you'll notice there's a lot of state creeping into the network. But the focus is on isolation. It's about a spectrum of isolation cases. Clearly, I could build a fully isolated network by having my own private network that was nothing to do with, the, uh, with anyone else. Uh, it's the way we used to do it. Do it. But the problem with... Um, uh, with that is it's very expensive. Clearly I could run best effort uh, and that's cheap because I shared the resources. The question is uh, how do we set something in the middle that's good enough? Because good enough is good enough is a really good uh, uh, metaphor to, to, to vary in mind when working on network technologies. The determinism will rely on a technology we'll meet in a moment called IEEE uh, time sensitive networking. And another technology that we'll meet in a moment called deterministic uh, networking, which is a, a, an IETF um, approach for delivering determinism at the uh, internet layer. Uh, one of the technologies being strongly pushed by some of the vendors is a technology called segment routing using IPv6, sometimes known as SRV6. And this is a technology where you specify the path by putting in the packet a, a set of segment identifiers, uh, which are IP addresses, which tell you uh, where the packet is to go and what resources to use. Some of you may notice that this is very similar to the old fashioned source routing, which has been in internet technologies, well, since IPv4 was invented in the uh, mid 70s. And, and, and what's basically happened is that no one knew what to do with it in those days. And people are now realizing that um, source routing is a good way of steering the packet uh, through the uh, set of resources that you want it to go along. There are some interesting security issues, but I'm sure we'll get in front, you know, get those solved. So time sensitive, um, time sensitive networking. This started in about 2012 and evolved from a project uh, called the audio uh, video bridging uh, uh, technology group. And uh, that, I believe, in itself arose as an offshoot 
of a technology called IEEE 1588. And if any of you are, uh, know, uh, are involved in time transmission, you'll know that that's uh, kind of one of the, was one of the gold standards, is one of the gold standards of uh, distributing high quality time around the network. Well, the media guys um, decided that um, they wanted to use it for uh, building um, studios. And uh, I went to a really good uh, example of this in um, uh, Dolby, Dolby Labs in California. And uh, they showed a first class, absolutely brilliant, uh, high definition, <coughs> excuse me, studio. And, but the studio was lots and lots of panels, all um, touched edge to edge, and they were all run, so it's a cinema sort of uh, quality, and they were all run with different uh, feeds and different computers on each of the panels, but they all synchronized to make a perfect display. Uh, so the origin of, of, of audio video, video uh, bridging was um, the entertainment industry, but the technology that's come out uh, has been attracted to uh, industrial automation uh, people and also to automotive uh, people. Uh, the idea here is that instead of having a wire to, uh, from you know, uh, a, a lot of wires in your car, for example, you basically have an internet in your car. And when you press the brake pedal, uh, it'll, um, the, uh, the brakes do come on exactly as you want and with the right cadence and all those sorts of things. And you get really kind of annoyed if that didn't work. Um, they're involving a, a set of traffic shaping and scheduling schemes. I've got a little snip of, of that in a moment. Um, to make this work, they require coordinated time and scheduling uh, in the network. Uh, that is to say, they basically uh, are building a TDM overlay on top of a, um, a packet network and trying to get the benefits of uh, the economy of scale of best effort together with um, a, a scheduled high precision um, service. There are a number of queuing things I'm going to talk about. And there's a, another technology that TSM had called uh, FREF, uh, Frame Replication and Elimination for Reliability. And I'm going to talk more about that, on, but on a slightly different uh, context. So here's the basis of how TSN uh, wanted to work. So if we look in the top half here, uh, what they do is they assign a bunch of VLAN priorities for uh, VLAN uh, priorities are, are used for saying how important a packet is. So they assign a, a number of these just for ordinary traffic, right? Ordinary best effort um, stuff, some of which is more important than other. Right? And then they assign one priority to um, a very high, uh, the, the deterministic service, the service that um, is not as high bandwidth as some of the other services may be, but when you want a, a, a packet delivered, it must be delivered and it must be delivered at a precise time. So what they do is um, they set up a series of cycles. That's why um, time synchronization is so important. And they, um, uh, they schedule the priority traffic to go at the start of a cycle, take the amount of time and, uh, and hence bandwidth it's allocated, and uh, then they allow everyone else to go. Well, if you go and look on this uh, Wikipedia page over here, it's a good example of a whole series of developments of this. Um, but what they ended up having to do was to create this guard band here. So this guard band here is the time that you have to stop transmitting your best effort traffic in order that the uh, high priority traffic gets through when it's supposed to. Because if you have a very long packet in the tail end of this section here, then that may extend over here into the time reserved for the uh, high priority precision traffic and that's not acceptable because uh, you know all this uh, was uh, uh, scheduled for bandwidth and uh, scheduled for priority and you can't afford to have it delayed particularly as it was sort of you know probably sort of end up over here and be outside uh, the your, um, uh, your your assigned delivery time so what they what they decided to do and it was quite neat and 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 I triply are very good at doing this sort of thing down in the Mac layer down the bottom of the um, of the network is that you take a, a packet that um, 
is uh, going to be sent and uh, you notice it's too long so you stop sending that bracket you you break sending it and then you restart it here some of you may notice that, uh, that this is really fragmentation but it's a very special hardware type of fragmentation uh, that's going to happen at um, very high um, um, speed um, and it and it's only uh, going to be sort of one fragment in the um, in the packet so what about deterministic networking so this is a project that's um, running in the ITF we are just publishing the uh, we, we've published the data plane framework the architecture has been published that was published a little while ago so the architecture says how all the bits and pieces fit together uh, the area that interested me was the data plane and um, we've uh, just published the data plane framework and we're in the closing stages of publishing the details of how uh, deterministic networking will work uh, with each um, network layer type uh, that the IETF um, standardizes this has got uh, something very similar to um, uh, FRA, uh, which is packet replication elimination uh, reordering function. And I'll explain how that works. But that's only there for one of the IETF technologies. It's only there for a technology called MPLS. For those of you who've not met MPLS before, what that is normally used to do is to carry IP, but it can carry almost any traffic type you through you know, using a technology called pseudo wires and um, it uh, instead of using a full IP address it uses a 32-bit uh, full IP header it uses a 32-bit shim and in there is a tag called a label which gives the network a hint about where the packet is to go uh, a very precise hint but it's only 20 bits long so it's quite um, uh, limited in scope uh, anyway, you use the outer labels for steering it and you use the inner labels for saying special things about the packet. For example, um, how it is to be handled when it egresses the MPLS network. So we have a, a solution that I'm going to talk about in the next slide. The IETF solution has so far been constrained by a requirement that we are not allowed to change the, uh, the data plane. Um, so the IP approach really provides little beyond good traffic engineering and in my view will need some new functions uh, if it is to um, have uh, the same capabilities as MPLS but that's not as easy as it looks. Uh, there's no discussion yet in that world on uh, packet queuing at the network layer. Obviously you can run it over uh, TSN for improved queuing performance but TSN is not really a very wide area technology. Um, and it can really be regarded more as a mitigation service rather than an assurance service. Find my mouse. So what's packet um, replication, elimination and reordering? So first off, you'll notice the very quaint old fashioned ASCII art that we use in the IETF to, uh, to describe things. There is a reason for this. Um, there was originally a reason that it was a sort of lowest common denominator but one of the reasons we use it is that it really forces you to think about what the simplest way of describing something is so we start off with a packet here and uh, we put it in the um, the first replication node and what that does is that uh, and these are all the, the where the, the position of these nodes and their their replication function and who they're sending the packet to is all configured by network management so we replicate the packet. So we send one copy to R1, we'll call that 1.1, and we send another copy to R4, we'll call that uh, 1.2. Then um, R4 um, also replicates um, uh, packet 1.2. It makes one copy that goes up to R2, and it makes another copy which continues closer to the destination. Uh, so um, 1.2. 2.1 got to R2 before 1.1 and so what the elimination function does is that it um, it uh, eliminates copy 1.1 throws it away and just takes 1.2.1 because it got there first that continues towards the exit node here too 
but 1.2.2 got there first and so 1.1 is killed and 1.2.2 is passed uh, forward or rather 1.2.2 is passed forward and 1.1 uh, 1.2.1 when it arrives is um is killed there are some very interesting technology problems um, um, in building this because um, to do elimination you need to do um, uh, state recording of when a packet arrived and it's not a given in an IP network that um, this packet from R3 will arrive on even the same line card as the packet from R4 and shared state across a uh, line cards in a high performance router is a very very hard problem so we're probably going to have to change the processing architectures on a lot of the, uh, on any high-end routers we want to do this to to do egress elimination and the egress the output port on routers is not really geared up to do a lot of computing at the moment it's really just geared up to put things in a queue and um, and, and take them out again very very simple uh, processing normally so this new state here is going to be a challenge for the uh, the router designers uh, a lot of people in the media industry who uh, first proposed this sort of thing, uh, they were expecting to run this on single chip uh, routers and uh, it's much easier to do the shared state then. So queuing developments. So what happens traditionally in, um, in networks is uh, that the queuing classifies a packet by priority you remember those TC bits um, and maybe one or two other features in the packet and it puts it in a FIFO, in a FIFO first in first out queue <coughs> when it puts it in a number of them <clears throat> removal from the queue can be either by simple priority first in first out um, single queue or it can be a weighted removal technique so I may put the packets <coughs> into a number of queues and I may say one from you, two from you, one from you, two from you, um, in order to uh, make, allow everyone to have some, um, uh, make some progress, but nonetheless specify uh, an allocation of bandwidth according to priority. <coughs> what I could have, uh, although I've not honestly seen it, is scheduled removal. That is to say, I put the packet um, into a queue and I only remove it uh, at a certain um, time. And if I've got scheduled arrival and scheduled removal, then I can reserve some bandwidth uh, and resources for a particular traffic uh, class that I want to be determin deterministic. And, and I can uh, schedule that it gets uh, um, sent at the time I specify. There are new techniques that are being developed, and this is very much in the uh, in the active research area. One, and we'll look at that in a moment, is um, urgency-based um, queuing. That is to say, I um, can um, uh, I, I, I pull a packet out um, when I see it's getting closer to the time it's allowed to be stored in me in my in my my, my node. Um, or I, there's another um, technique, which I, I, I think is active um, work in terms of how to build it, which is a push in first out queue. So that's, we do this all the time in software, you know, we, we, what we do in software is we uh, might sort a queue and um, uh, search a queue and find out where we want to put a, an object in it so that it gets out at the time we want to service it. Really easy in software not so easy at a terabit a second where um, you know nanoseconds and picoseconds count and you have to find ways of uh, getting the hardware to um, to help you for when I say a terabit a second a terabit a second is where we're trying to go 400 megabits is cooking technology in uh, the uh, high-end wide area So what about latency based forwarding, right? So um, uh, this was put together by my friends, uh, Alex Clem and uh, Tullus Eckert. And what they've, they've set up a scenario here where um, I know the link delays and um, my contract, um, we'll come to what we mean by contracts in a moment, um, is to deliver the packet uh, with an end to end delay of eight milliseconds. 
So the um, predicted um, delay in the in the node itself, uh, computed by the control plane, is um, uh, going to be uh, 1.5 milliseconds, and the remaining nodes are therefore only. It turns out have only got three milliseconds left. So. <coughs> The local delay budget is um, 1.8 milliseconds, and the, but it turns out the actual delay is 1.5 milliseconds. Um, so we get to the next node, and uh, the, uh, the local delay is uh, 2 milliseconds, and it turns out the actual delay was 2.5. So we get to the very last node, and uh, the, uh, here, the delay it's allowed is 1.5 milliseconds. And what we do is we make sure at that node that the actual delay is 1.5 milliseconds by scheduling the output uh, of the packet to the time we want. And this allows us to do an on-time contracted end-to-end uh, -end delay of 8 milliseconds. So obviously to do this, we need to put some time information in the packet. And you might notice that IP packets don't have that capability yet. So we would have to add uh, an option in uh, or an extension header in IP um, to do this. Uh, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about the, uh, some of the issues in a moment there. So we've done some studies in the uh, research group I'm in um, about uh, the, the, the Futureway research group about the shortcomings of uh, the current forwarding layers. The addresses are too long. Yeah, you know, there are some things that only want tiny addresses and the 128 bits clutters the thing up and this is large compared to the data you want to send, particularly a problem in IoT. They're too short. So what people have been doing is these network programming things and um, they want to write a program in the, basically they want to specify lots of possible things that could happen to the packet in the last few bits of the address. And the, I think they think they've got about 16 bits to do it. Well, you may run out of the bits. The addresses are always from the same family. Um, some people think we need a, a mixed family um, node. And they're of limited semantics. Basically, all we can say in an address is send it here, or we can sneak some of the bits at the end and say, sneak it here, and when we do it there, send it to a VPN somewhere. But th th these are really quite limited semantics. The specification for IPv6, the world is moving to IPv6, there's no question about that. Specification of IPv6, RFC 8200, is almost unchangeable to meet new needs because it was designed as an end-to-end -end, uh, host to server protocol and the people who designed it are very reluctant to um, change it to add um, some of the new features. For example, some people want to add extension headers in the middle of the, 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 uh, the path, and there's been huge objection to, uh, to doing that. And, and for good reasons, in some cases, for, um, for uh, security reasons, for example, but that's not good if what you want to do is a, is a, is a, a well-defined domain um, a particular application. All of these existing uh, data planes only really support a bit better than best effort. I mean, the best we can do so far with um, in the uh, network layer is um, the DetNet stuff for MPLS, and that really is only a bit better than best effort. Uh, time sensitive networks are not fully solved. Um, TSN has got a very limited um, 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 physical. Um, uh, scope and uh, DetNet is constrained by its underlay capabilities. So what we need is a lightweight method of providing multiple network instructions in a packet. Uh, we need richer quad capabilities and we need a way for applications to ask for more from the network than they can today and the a network to know a little bit more about the packet than it does today and and that latter uh, is causing uh, a number of people to have concern because of this big uh, permissionless issue with permissionless uh, innovation on the network that is to say I can just do anything I want in the internet and a um, uh, the issue of privacy if I need to know more 
So uh, one of the proposals is to say, well, we need a new, a new, a new IP protocol. Uh, this is a project that is set about to propose a set of enhancements to IP to address some of its shortcomings designed around the principle of a contract between the user and the network to deliver the packet according to a certain set of parameters. Uh, thus, determinism will be a contract between the user and the operator. <coughs> it's very controversial, as much, uh, really, because of the country of origin of the proposal. However, my view is quite simple. We're engineers. We need to leave the geopolitics out of the discussion and work out what approach best delivers the needs of the user. So a little bit about uh, um, <coughs> new IP. It's um, based on the idea of multiple address types. Um, it's based on the idea that we will have to support quality of communications. And it's particularly core <coughs> is the need to do high precision contract uh, communications. So if you think about classical mail versus IP, right? classical mail, you uh, take a, a letter, you write the address on the, uh, the output uh, on it, and you put it in the header, and it delivers it to the destination. Um, uh, so it delivers the letters to the destination, just like IP, where you write the destination address on the outside, and you um, uh, set it, send it to the, uh, to, to the user. By the way, you'll notice that Source and destination in here, um, they're not actually needed except to do certain things, certain types of protocol action um, at the, in the most primitive way. Uh, MPLS only has destination addresses. Yeah, um, provided you've got some other way of knowing how to get back to the user, you don't need source addresses. Uh, so what about FedEx as a, as a, as a good example, right, of, of, of just what, of, um, instead of having just the destination address, you have the contract, you have, FedEx is, is one of many alternatives, of course, um, you write in there when you want it delivered, uh, who's to sign for it, a whole bunch of other things uh, um, in terms of the contract for what you are going to do when you receive this piece of uh, mail or package and how you're going to send it to the user. And we think of high performance communications, high precision communications, more in the uh, high end um, um, mail delivery class, uh, physical mail delivery class, whereas um, put a second class stamp on the letter um, is more a better effort service and that is what uh, the classical internet delivers. Um, here's um, a, 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 some of the sort of technologies we're experimenting with in this case. Um, clearly you have um, you need address, you need a contract. A contract is what tells you um, the delivery service, whether the packets be delivered in time or on time or um, uh, with uh, minimum loss. Um, the uh, and, and then it has the uh, obviously has the payload um, uh, afterwards and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we need to put in here in, presumably in the contract um, which is um, uh, to do with um, how you steer it through various resources. Now the problem with all of the existing designs is that they're based on these extension headers and you can't find out what an extension header is until you look at the uh, this is existing IP. Uh, you can't find out what an extension header is until you look at the first, uh, the beginning of it. It's a type length value um, system. And that means that you have to walk down a whole bunch of these to find the one that uh, you're going to process. So it's really hard to get parallel processing to be applied. And it's very hard to get directly to the element that you want to find um, in the header. So one of the things that we're thinking of doing is to put a manifest in the, um, in the front of the packet. And the manifest says what is in there in terms of the important uh, things that the packet processor will need to, uh, to find and where they are so it can jump straight um, to them. So there are a number of emerging applications that um, uh, require us to evolve IP from a best effort net, uh, network, which is what it is today and serving as well, to a deterministic network. There are a number of technologies that can introduce this, and these can be introduced in, uh, introduced in stages, and I've, I've kind of given a, a, a very high level overview of uh, a number of them. 
structural changes in the internet significantly mitigate the deployment problem of these new technologies. Everyone says it's really hard to develop and deploy new network layer um, um, uh, infrastructure and that is because uh, traditionally the packet went end to end in uh, multiple different networks but we can we saw at the beginning that that's not the way the internet is evolving it's evolving as a set of constrained networks that are interconnected <clears throat> and oft, sometimes the interconnection happens via our private networks rather than uh, via public. Uh, there's an open question as to whether we can modify IP as it is today to meet these needs or whether we need to make a fresh start. Modifying IP will result in a very complex data plane. Complex data planes <coughs> are fine if you can do software processing of them, but when you get to the very top end performance requirements, that's really tough. <coughs> Alternatives such as new IP will find it very hard to gain traction against the deployed base, um, but has the potential um, to deliver the sort of performance and the new and the characteristics we want in ways that are very difficult with the existing network. There's clearly a lot of research to be done in this area and um, a lot of work to be done to work out uh, which is the right way forward. And that's it for me this evening. So does anyone have any questions, please? <clears throat> Did I lose the net? Uh, sorry. <coughs> right. Uh, let's. Uh, I need to put my camera on so I can be seen. S Stuart, uh, you haven't got your camera on at the moment. I was about to do that. I was about to do that. I was worried for a moment that I'd been talking to myself for a while. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <coughs> well, thank you very much, Stuart. There are a number of questions, and uh, um, the the uh, I, I'll. Uh, I'll read them out and choose, choose them and re, slightly regroup them in a minute. But before that, there is a, a, also an announcement. And that is, if anybody uh, who's on tonight actually wants to um, uh, get points for, the, uh, uh, for, for their CPD certificate, please could you email Julie Hudson well, the uh, email address is jhudson, no, no uh, full stop in it, jhudson at the IET org, uh, sorry, the IET dot org. And that, and that is the, for the CPD certificate. So going on from that, um, the, the first question is the really, w will we be able to, um, have presentation slides. Um, if you agree to it, Stuart, we could put them on the uh, the Sussex IET website. So that that was the the first question. Would you agree to that, Stuart? I need to really think about that because a lot of these are my boss's slides, and they're not um, okay. uh, taken from so, a number of. Um, so <laughs> we will we, we'll, we'll uh, see that mm -hmm. um, the the recording will hopefully be uh, available yes and uh, then that and it will be uh, go, going on to YouTube so it will be um, available via the YouTube right the first sort of technical question was from John Fletcher and that is that um, it was it was fairly early on in the talk so I don't know if you he would like to know a little bit more about HTTP stroke three and quick or Q U I C. Uh, uh, do you feel you've said enough about that or would you like to quickly say something? Well, they're completely orthogonal to the thrust of the rest of the, uh, of the talk, right? Um, I don't know anything about HTTP three, but I imagine it's uh, a development of HTTP, which is the um, method of uh, um, transporting web requests around the network. But that is way, way, way up in the sky compared to where I normally hang around. QUIC is a transport protocol that uh, was uh, put in place originally by Google and then was um, standardized by the IETF. Um, <clears throat> and what what they did was um, 
Well, first off, they did it as an interesting challenge because people found it impossible to evolve TCP. And so what they did was they ran a transport protocol um, over the top of UDP. So the network will always let UDP through. And um, they... Um, uh, so what they did was they put the clever bits inside an encrypted uh, payload that was carried in UDP. So UDP just gets it to the server and then the encrypted payload uh, has got all the sort of clever bits that do uh, reliability, etc. Now, the problem with this is that the operators can't see the insides of the packet. And with a technology called DOH, um, DNS over HTTP, uh, or HTTPS, um, they can't see where the requests are, so they can't tune the traffic. And actually, there's a bit of a problem because there are some legal responsibilities they have that they can't execute because they've got no idea what's in the request and where the traffic is going other than it's going um, to, a, uh, to a server. Um, so anyway, um, uh, Quick is really a new and fairly aggressive um, transport protocol. Aggressive in the sense that it's not. It's it's. Some people say it's not fair against TCP, and the re the only way that best effort really works is that people sort of play a fair game and don't take too much um, uh, bandwidth. It, it, I've seen presentations that suggest Quick is too aggressive. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, the next question is, in fact, um, there are two questions from Ian Sturrock. Uh, would you like them both together or one at a time? Depends how related they are. Well, well <laughs> I, I think probably better one at a time. Okay, and on okay. The second one, you can say, well, I've already said that. Uh, yeah. So, Right. The first one is in the enhanced uh, VPN slide, it talks about traffic being tagged at ingress and steered through the set of reserved resources. How does that differ from MPLS stroke QoS, which are quality of service? Well, MPLS is one way of doing this. Um, but what we, MPLS, so there's MPLS RSVP TE, where we set up an absolutely nailed down path. And the only thing we reserve there is the long-term integrated uh, bandwidth that's available. Um, so um, what we're trying to do in VPN plus is operate at a much finer uh, level of isolation and resource guarantee. So it's closer, if anything, to <clears throat> something like, um, um, so I should go back and explain that one of the reasons that RSVP TE based MPLS hasn't uh, uh, got major rollout is because people were worried about the scaling of it, <coughs> in particular the soft state, state scaling. That is to say, it's a dynamic routing protocol that holds up a path as long as the nodes are talking to each other and agreeing to hold it up. And that consumes a lot of resource and a lot of network operators <coughs> found this too troubling. <coughs> And so it's not widely deployed other than for special applications. Segment routing um, does it by putting a stack of labels on the front of the packet or a set of IP addresses in the source routing fields. And um, that requires no soft state. That is state put in at the edge of the network. Now, um, so what we're trying to do with um, uh, VPN plus is to introduce more state into the network, uh, but to do it in a way that's sustainable. That is to say, not the soft state method, but actually have a control plane um, or a, um, an SDN controller uh, put the required state, i.e. reserved resources into the, uh, to the nodes. And we're trying to also have a more sophisticated queuing um, design so that res true resources are reserved for, um, for services that need them. Okay. There's well, an IETF draft on the subject. If you look at BPM Plus in the, um, in the IETF uh, T's working group, Transport Engineering Working Group, there's a, a, a draft on it. Right. The <clears throat> second question from Ian Tharak is, in the early days of video calls when bandwidth was limited, various techniques were used, including sending frame delta uh, information instead of full frame data each time. 
Are similar approaches being considered stroke employed for holographic applications? Um, so yes, uh, there's a whole sort of, this is a whole research area in itself. The problem that you have, however, is that uh, you have very, very limited um, time uh, to do the encode because you remember I said that if you get it wrong and you take too long, um, you, you, the, the, the um, users are actually physically sick. Um, so a bit because of the sensory sort of misalignment problem. And of course, you've got to be able to um, uh, you know, look at any angle. So there are field approaches, as I understand it, that are being uh, used, where instead of uh, sending lots of images, you send um, sort of a, a model description. Um, but that's not my area of uh, specialism. So um, sorry, I can't give you any more details. Okay, uh, the next question is uh, from Steve. And it is, Network slices looks like it would conflict with net neutrality with keeping the net open. How do you maintain the open net whilst at the same time provide the surface services talked about as and then in brackets as soon as you put priority or different packets for a service the net can stop being open. Well, that is the big dilemma. Of course, the net's never been fully open. Um, it's never been fully open in that I could always buy a service uh, from the service provider if I wanted to anyway. So, and it's also a bit of a challenge in another dimension because it's not really open anyway, right? So if you look, if you remember the very first model I, uh, I had, uh, I don't know how easy it is to get to it, um, where... I really would advise you to go re go and look up Jeff Houston's um, work. Uh, let's go back to here. Right. So here is the net neutral um, 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 network that uh, most people think the internet is like. But as I was saying, it's not really like that. Um, it's uh, you know, quite often with all that Netflix stuff you'll get will be on a little server that's actually tucked up right close to the edge of the network and um, uh, because they've got lots of money and they're able to get it over here, they're getting a much better um, service, a much more instantaneous service at more bandwidth <coughs> than someone who starts off by uh, with a server over here, say in India, and is trying to serve a user over here in the United Kingdom across all this best effort stuff. Um, so it is neutral in the sense that anyone with enough money can pay the service providers to um, uh, get their uh, stuff deployed out uh, close to the edge, although in practice they'll go to one of the people who specialise in providing that service. Um, Cloudflare I think is uh, an example of one, but there are others. Um, uh, so it's neutral in the sense that anyone with the same with with lots of money can get their server close to the edge um, but I'm not sure that there's much more we can do than that because there simply isn't the latency um, uh, and the the bandwidth um, to run this model for some of these uh, some of these services okay but go and look at uh, Jeff Houston's Death of Transit to understand uh, really what the network looks like and why it needs to look like it. Okay, right. A couple of questions from uh, Martin. Again, I'm going to uh, uh, ask them one at a time and you can say uh, uh, what, what about the second question. The first question, isn't the TSN-TX transmission scheme a little like a, a variation of a real-time computer program uh, interrupt service uh, routing. Is, is that so? Uh, yes, it is, uh, although we don't normally do it with packets. So um, it is exactly like, um, um, like that, um, but it's, it's done um, by package, for packet scheduling. And um, yeah, like I say, we don't normally do that. Okay. The next question from Martin is, uh, all you've covered so far seems to be time domain based. Is that correct? Is any work going on with frequency domain multiplexing? 
So um, clearly in the um, physical underlying transport, now transport's an interesting word here, right? Because uh, you've heard me talk about TCP, which is a transport layer. The people who design the physical structure on which all of this runs call that the transport network. So the optical network in which this stuff runs is also called, is called the transport network. And down there, they are doing exactly this. They're doing um, dense wavelength division multiplexing. They're getting huge numbers of lambdas on a fiber. And clearly, I could um, build a network based on um, slices that use um, physical um, a different lambda for each one, and I have to have a whole end-to-end -end architecture based on that. But the the stuff that I don't use um, uh, for the reserved uh, use is wasted. I can't recover it. And that's why packet networks were so, um, were so economic and efficient. Uh, that is to say because they had a good way of using the, um, the uh, unused uh, resources for cheaper um, services that were content with not quite such good uh, delivery. So um, we really are forced into a world of time domain multiplexing in order to get efficient use of the resources, although we still have the ability to build completely independent networks on their own network infrastructure, and we do that with frequency division multiplexing, particularly over fiber optics. <clears throat> okay, um, the next question is from Greg Hobbs, and it is, don't these proposals conflict with net neutrality obligations or are they no longer a consideration? Well, um, some of these, of course, aren't, aren't necessarily public uh, networks, in which case um, uh, such obligations don't really apply other than you know, to do with um, uh, economic um, comp competition laws. Um, so um, if we're talking about the open internet, everyone is expecting there to be um, um, net neutrality and uh, we don't take any we don't take any notice about what the application is, particularly around, for example, the core here. Um, but you end up in a dilemma, really, because if the physics demand a certain type of uh, design, you have no choice but to um, either decline the application or do what the physics tells you. And the physics tells you that you have to get the application close to the to the user, and you have to get the um, uh, the, the 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 packets associated with it handled in a certain way. But that says nothing about who can buy this service. Okay. <clears throat> right. The next one is from an anonymous attendee, and it is, given the billions invested in the current network, what are the first steps to moving to new IP? Um, to define a set of businesses that uh, find uh, an it to be overwhelming economically advantageous to have this service and to deploy it in areas um, of the network um, where uh, they wish to connect. You're not going to deploy it end to end here. You know, that's not how it starts. There's no way of doing that. But within a service provider domain um, of some sort or a provider domain of some sort, then um, if you had, for example, a set of companies that uh, were prepared to pay for this service, you could connect them together. For example, two factories on either side of a city. Okay. <laughs> Did I lose the net then? It's not you, Stuart. Okay, it's Mike. David, did you want to take over while Mike's sorting his internet out? <clears throat> yes, I'll, I'll read the, the next uh, question. We, we lost Mike a little earlier, but uh, it seems to have happened again. Um, this is from uh, Richard Strike. He says, Stuart, is it realistic to think we could introduce a new version of IP 
given the time it has taken to adopt IP version 6. <coughs> Presumably if we did add a manifest before the IP addresses, there is no backwards compatibility. Um, well, uh, so let me give you an example. Many years ago, about 20 years ago, people decided that IPv4 couldn't do what, it, uh, what they wanted it to do. And so they introduced a technology called MPLS, which I've spoken about from time to time. I think it's rather a cool idea. And they introduced it in a limited domain. And they introduced it so that the users in this domain, this is uh, for you know, a, um, a well-known provider domain, for example, they, they introduced it so that they could apply special services to the um, users uh, that were prepared to pay for that technology. For example, people who wanted a traffic engineered path, people who wanted an ethernet to go across the network um, and uh, be carried in an economic way. Um, so within limited domains, you can introduce uh, services. There are ways of doing it. The art in doing it is to design it so that the fibers and the routers that exist in this domain can carry both sorts of traffic. So in, in, if we take the MPLS case, then those routers would uh, use IP to control them. They would carry IP for regular uh, traffic of this sort of sort up here, but they would also carry special purpose traffic. So you could imagine that um, uh, that you could roll this out in domains where it made sense and um, run it as ships in the uh, the night. Um, in terms of, you know, is it realistic given in the length of time it is uh, taken to get IPv6 out there? IPv6 took a long time because, uh, amongst other things, no one saw the economic advantage of deploying it. That's why it took a long time. With new IP, um, that will get deployed or not if there is an overwhelming economic advantage in doing so um, uh, in the same way that MPLS got deployed because there was an overwhelming economic advantage. Fundamentally, we do all the engineering we like and it's all down to money. Okay, just one more question. There's, there's a comment from Norman which is really aimed at, at us as organizers of these, these events, which we'll take on board. Uh, but the final question is from Jim, who just really says, I mean, it may really uh, have been covered by what you just said, you know, how likely are these proposals to come to pass and by when? Uh, I think you probably answered that already. Yeah, and the answer is, I mean, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, I'm a researcher. Uh, we, we have problems to, to speak. People need to do new things in networks. We're researching ways of doing them. Um, and um, at the end of the day, it all comes down to money. It all comes down to if there is a, uh, a sufficient demand for the sort of capabilities and uh, it, then they will be deployed. And whether they're deployed on old IP with some modifications or new IP or something we haven't yet thought about will depend on what's the most viable economic solution. Okay, thank you. That's the, the end of our list of questions, Stuart. So on behalf of the audience, and I think we got up to about 98 people at one point, um, I'd like to thank you very much, uh, particularly on behalf of, of Mike, who's not able to be with us just at the moment. Uh, thank you very much for your time and, and the, the talk, which clearly a lot of our audience found very stimulating and, and very informative. So on our behalf, Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, my pleasure. And thank you to all the audience um, and good night to everyone.